Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Khan and Dennis Dick. Had some uh, last-minute technical gremlins this morning, but I think I'm back up, so I, I apologize for the slight delay. But we are up and running this morning. Got a lot of earnings to discuss. Carl Icahn's letter uh, opposing the Cigna Express Scripts merger is out. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the VIX falling back to January lows. The slow and steady march back to all-time highs in the market. Joel, tell us what's happening in the market overnight. Ah, we're in the green, Spencer, by five and a half handles. Uh, caught a bid just under the close of 50 even, 48 and a quarter is your pre-market low. Pre-market high, 58.50. Folks, I'm looking for 26.66.75. That was your January 30th high, 14 handles. That's my target on the upside. Downside, uh, we take out this uh, this pre-market low of 48 and a quarter. Still got a little support at 46 and a quarter. And then Friday or Monday's low down at 35 even. Moving on to the crude. Uh, gave, it, gave back some gains yesterday, but back knocking on the door is 70 bucks. Up 76 cents at 69.77. Just be aware, the high from yesterday, 69.92. Gold up but 530 at 1223 even. Silver in the red by 15 cents at 1550. And Bitcoin spent a little time under 7,000. That was yesterday, but uh, back over 7,000 now. Trying to take out yesterday's high. This is in the SIPO futures of 71.45. Let's bring in uh, Triple D, Triple D. We got some gremlins this morning, but how you doing? I'm having a rough one too here. Um, I've on my first three day losing streak. I feel like in years, I don't remember the last time I had a three day losing streak. So it's just one of those things. I'm, I do the same things day in, day out, same strategies, very much like clockwork. So a lot of stat are stuff's usually pretty consistent, but it's just like ever since I got lifted on that SVU, remember that, that was the turning point for me because I had been so hot. Everything I had touched turned to gold. I had that offer out there at like 20 and a half on SVU, and I got taken over at 32 bucks, and I got lifted and left five five grand on the table. And since that point in time, I've had just bad luck. And it seems like every like yesterday, Intel gets downgraded. I happen to be long Intel as an overnight trade. So, you know, you get hit on that. And it seems like every morning I come in, it's like something's moving against me that, you know, and, and it's just, you know, bad luck. It's hit and miss. You know, you can just have random 20, 30 overnight positions. You know, sometimes the news is going to work for you. Sometimes it's going to work against you. I'm just on this little streak where I'm starting the hole because I get some position that had bad news against it. And then I'm fighting my way out or trying to claw my way out. And I just can't quite seem to get there. So the three-day losing streak is not bad because almost all three of those days, I almost got it back up to scratch by fighting my way back. But it seems like every morning I'm starting in the hole. That's a tough, tough climb when you're already starting the hole. I am buying the triple D. to just daily, daily calls. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy the Wednesday, Thursday. I'll go out to the Friday weeklies because uh, that's pretty unusual. Uh, but you know, like you said, when you, when you're playing the news. You know, you never know how the stocks you are going to You might misinterpret, or it's just you get stuck and the news goes the other way. Sometimes it's not playing the news, too. Sometimes I'm just doing a pure stat or play. And then when you hold something overnight, you're always subject to news. And I mean, on any given night, there's, you know, a chance, probably a 1% to 2% chance. There could be some news on your stock, especially on, you know, a bigger stock. If you're carrying a bigger one, there's more apt to be news on that. So some of the smaller stocks, usually it's just the quarterly reports, the odd analyst upgrade, downgrade, but not much more than that. I'm always very cautious with uh, with trading the biotechs because with the biotechs, it always seems like um, they're they're more prone to news. So I never like you know the, the bigger ones. Yes, the smaller ones is always a little bit sketchy. I'm always if I if I do take a smaller biotech overnight, I usually do it on a half position. 
because they have random drug news and those things can move 20% or 30% on you. So obviously in the bigger companies don't do that. So I'll do the Celgenes and the Gileads with normal size. But if you're trading some small little biotech, one trick ponies, I usually do them in half size just to try to avoid, you know, the random news that could work against you. But it's, it's one of those uh, bad luck streaks where I've got, you know, two, three days or I've started in the hole every single day. I'm starting in the hole here again today, although already trying to claw my way back, working out of it a little bit. I had some discovery long, which I got stuck with overnight. We know how I do that. I, I like to buy almost every earnings stock before the report. Sometimes I get really busy at the close and I miss or I forget about one. And I'm like, oh, I forgot. So then I try to maybe work out of it after hours. And sometimes I can't. I tried discovery all night. I was trying to get out. I did not want to go through the report long because AMCX already missed. So I did not want to be long. I want to be long discovery going into the report, but sell it before four o'clock or, you know, at least you know, sell it before, you know, so I can get out before the earnings report while well, they report and they miss. So now it's trading down. So I'm getting hit a little bit here, trying to work out of it. I'm not that scared on this one because the AMCX did claw its way back too. And Discovery has, you know, been in play. So I don't think they hit it down too far, even though the earnings report was, diff or was uh, not good. I don't think they just slaughter it because there has been rumors around Discovery here for the last few months. So I think you'd have, you know, some people coming in if it got down to like, you know, the 25 handle, I think you find buyers. So I'm not that scared on this one. But despite the report not being great, and AMCX came back too. So I did not want to go to the report, through the report long, and then they come out miss, and I'm like, come on. Anyway, so it's one of those bad luck streaks. Bad luck streaks happen. What do you do when you're having bad luck? You maybe reduce your size a little bit, you you back off some strategies a little bit. I'm not going to do that because I don't feel like I'm trading bad. I feel like I'm having bad luck. I actually feel like I'm trading pretty good right now. And sometimes, you know, I was talking to my buddy from Bright Trading, and he's traded, you know, for 15 years too, prop. Sometimes your best trades can be losing trades. And sometimes you can be trading really well and lose money just because you're having some news work against you or, or some other, you know, things happen. Sometimes you actually can make money and be trading poorly. So you've got to be able to identify yourself. I feel like I'm still trading okay right now. I still feel like my confidence is there. So I'm not backing off my size. I'm not backing off my strategies. I'm just having some bad luck. You know, the Intel downgrade yesterday was bad luck. It was out of the blue. There was an, and the only reason I had held it overnight because it was ex-dividend. I like to capture the dividend. But they also have it a downgrade on the ex-dividend day. So there's no way you're going to get that, you know, back and claw your way back on that one when it's starting down 50 or 60 cents. But, you know, that's the way it goes. You know, you're going to have good luck and bad luck as traders. You just got to be able to take them in stride. All right. Uh, do we want to do the discovery report trading down 26 cents? Yeah, you may as well. I'm stuck along with it right now. I'm going to work out of it today. Um, I'm probably going to try to work my best to not lose a ton of money here. But I'm not, like I guess I'm not that scared on it because AMCX came back. And all these content plays, especially the smaller ones, seem to have a bid below. So I don't think they slaughter it. Well, Discovery is already coming back a little bit here. The Q2 EPS, $0.30. Cents, I don't, I'm not sure how that compares, if at all, to the $0.86 cent estimate. If it does compare, it's a big miss, obviously. Sales, $2.8 billion versus $2.85 billion. A slight miss on that number. The Q2 uh, EP actually, that was uh, not adjusted numbers. The adjusted numbers for the EPS were $0.77 cents versus $0.86. Cents. So a miss on that regardless. Uh, stock train down here. Joel, you might as well do the talk. And yeah, real quick. Some of this is me trying to work yeah. out too. <laughs> uh, so I was talking about my own trades. <laughs> 300 measly shares uh, traded at that low at uh, 26 even. Uh, right now, I don't know if that's Dennis or someone else here trying to wiggle out here. At 26, uh, 89 is where we've uh, been the high of the last two brackets. Uh, we'll see what happens. In order, 26.92 is unchanged. So that's where the offers are lining up here in the pre-market. We'll use that as resistance. Jump over here. A lot of earnings reports last night and some stocks really get, rallying, some stocks really getting hit. I want to go to the Zillow report, which is ZG or Z, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's two different stocks uh, that are <laughs> both down 17% here. The report couldn't have been good. Spencer, give us the details. Yeah, first off, they're they're buying mortgage lands of America. So we know that this market does not like the buyers uh, in in acquisition. But the earnings for or I think it was just guidance that they gave, or they gave, or they had earnings because I'm I'm not sure why. Uh, I think it was just guidance that they gave. They, they gave Q3 um, sales guidance way below the estimate. Four to twelve million dollars was the estimate. Three thirty-seven to three forty-seven is the guidance they gave for the Q3 sales. The fiscal year sales also below estimates. Uh, EBITDA 
uh, guidance also lower. So I think that's just it was guidance. Cool. So stock here, obviously getting murdered. Uh, this is a big move here. I don't even know what to say. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming any option traders were not expecting a 10-point move on this thing. I don't know what the expected move was coming in, but wow, slaughtered. Uh, now, this one's interesting. You got a pre-market low of uh, 47.76, and you're about a buck and a quarter off that. And just trying to just kind of creep up here. Uh, you're taking out the former low of the move. Uh, man, you had a low at 51.58. That now can act as resistance. Uh, I do see some monthly support. I'll just give you these two levels, 48.24, uh, which has not come into play. It has, but it's back above it. And then you have two monthly lows right at the 46.40 area. So 48 and a quarter, 46.40 if continued downside. Uh obviously be a short covering rally in here sometime. So if you're not getting close to that pre-market low of 47.76, you may have to be buying this into an updraft. All right. Uh, it's, it's hit 14 though. So let's, let's halt on the earnings oh, for, us, wow. for a second. Yeah. We uh, got you time today, Dennis. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to grab Ivan Feinseth from Tigris Financial Partners, talk about his uh, latest changes to his coverage in a moment. And welcome back, everyone. Pre-market prep, Spencer Israel, Joel Elkan, and Dennis Dick, now joined by Ivan Feinseth. He is a partner and CIO at Tigris Financial Partners. Ivan, how goes it this morning? Very good. The futures are indicating a higher open again this morning as the momentum to new all-time highs in the S&P 500 continues to accelerate. So you're you're mostly a lot of your coverage is focused on on the tech sector. Not all of it, but a lot of it is uh, tech. One of the best sectors uh, this earnings season, just in terms of beating expectations. I think the only sectors who uh, who have had a higher percentage of companies uh, beat the streets estimates on earnings for this quarter were uh, or have been consumer staples uh, and healthcare. So tech has been strong. Uh, what's been kind of your take of this earnings season? Well, I, w I want to see leadership from tech, consumer, discretion, and financials, and we are seeing that. Uh, the majority of stocks in the tech sector, consumer discretion, even more so than consumer staples, which is important because, uh, cons to me, strength in consumer discretion shows a strong economy and high consumer confidence, which can also further a stronger economy, <clears throat> and also financials. To me, those are the sectors that have to lead the market higher. And they are the sectors that led the market to all-time highs in January and now are starting to lead the market higher now. I uh, saw yesterday, Ivan, the, this news out of Facebook and the stock popped on it that they had asked uh, large banks to share uh, user financial info with them and they can sort of integrate banking services into uh, into Facebook. And, and the stock did pop uh, on that news Uh but that doesn't really make sense to me because why would, with all the trust issues that Facebook has been has been having, you know, in the last six months or so, why would people want their financial information on Facebook? No, they're, they're not asking to share customers' financial information like account numbers and balances. What they're proposing to do with banks is to use Facebook Messenger as a platform for customer service. 
so that okay. you could interact with your bank in real time to um, find out balances, to you know, uh, view uh, transaction history in real time and have them take care of any uh, issues. Because unfortunately today, more people bank online and are ne- less likely to go in to see a teller and don't have a personal banker. So this could provide a real time access to some type of personal teller or banker to give you updates in real time and you could access it on your computer or most importantly on your mobile device wherever you are so this is not being viewed as a way of advertising it's the extension of facebook messenger into other areas which i think is a powerful growth tool and this is a very interesting proposal what what is your uh, 12 month price target on facebook and why I don't really have price targets, but I think okay. the stock is still going to go a lot higher. I think it will. I think the recent that 20% sell off in one day was uh, overdone. First of all, what caused that has been what Facebook has been saying for months, in some cases, years. They've been saying for many quarters that growth will slow. They can't go at 40 or 50%. They are going to go at 30%, which is still pretty good. And uh, the concerns over uh, daily active user engagement declining. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg himself has said people should not spend as much time as they do on Facebook. It's about quality of time, not length of time. So to me, there was nothing new. I don't know why the reaction was so uh, negative or or so shocking, other than the fact the stock had run up significantly into the earnings, but uh, all the trends are still in place. Uh, They didn't lose members uh, when they had, uh, and to me, there was no data breach. There was no data issue. I mean, basically, Facebook provides a social media platform for people to use for free. They don't provide it for free. They provide it for you to use for free because it's paid by the advertisers. Just like television used to be back in the day. You could watch shows for free and or, you know, they were paid for by the advertisers who had the commercials. So... Facebook uses your data, which you put out there. I mean, all of the, this is not a hack into uh, private data. It wasn't people's social security numbers or bank account numbers that got compromised. This is data people put out for everybody to see. And all they do is mine that data and most importantly, mine your interactions for things that you like and don't like to compile lists for advertisers to use to target people who would be the most likely customers for their product, which benefits the users because I don't think people mind advertising for things they're interested in. People definitely don't like advertising for things they're not interested in. So Facebook also uses the data to improve the member experience. And none of this is bad. I think it's it's all good. Um, the issues are now they have to make it a little easier to uh, opt out because people are, are, especially people who are not tech savvy, probably have a hard time figuring out the settings to how to include or exclude certain people or groups or the public from seeing all your data and they're fixing that and the other part of that um you know bad inf- actors false information hate speech they've added over twenty thousand people in the surveillance team to kind of get rid of that which they also said that they were doing since this started and they said that this will cost money it will hurt profitability in the near term but in the longer term, fix the problems that people have concerns over. So making it better in the future. So none of this was new. It's been talked about for a while. So that's why I think the sell-off is a buying opportunity, even at 185. I think that we'll see new highs in the stock by the fall. So many of these stocks, Ivan, like the main ones, it seems like they sell off on some news, but you can look at the fang. It seems like, you know, when you look at them three, four months later, they seem to always come back. I mean, maybe it's a buy the dip mentality of the market, but there's just certain stocks that when they sell off, they come back. It seems like even if the news is bad, they just claw, slowly claw their way back. Uh, just wanted to say and, and talk about Twitter's fall here, too, because it fell off significantly on the earnings. But it's trying to slowly claw its way back. And with the move with Facebook yesterday getting you know, a significant amount of its losses back to yesterday with an eight-point rally here, do you think Twitter can bounce back from these losses? I am not as bullish on Twitter as I am Facebook. I have a strong buy on Facebook. I've been neutral on Twitter for some time because I, I, I use Twitter myself and really like the service. I mean, it is a lot of fun and it's very effective. I have not yet engaged as a, you know, to use the paid part of the service. 
and that is the key. They they need to engage more users on the paid part, and uh, it's not been as effective as Facebook's ability to engage users to the paid part. I mean, commercial or advertisers to the paid part. So, um, out of the fine stocks, I've been negative on Netflix for some time. Uh, I believe that the growth was unsustainable, the valuation was unsustainable, and the upcoming streaming services from Disney, along with so many others, are going to be competition. So, but, I mean, you can't keep a good stock down. And uh, when good companies either stub their toe for a bad quarter or sell off because the expectations may have going into the earnings results may have been high, it is a buying opportunity. But, um, well- the, the growth is, I mean, our market, our economy is growing, our stock market's growing. It's being led by tech. Tech is the growth driver for the economy. So that's why I think tech is a, the most important sector and is growing. So that's why I favor tech over uh, and consumer st- uh, discretion over a number of other sectors. You just briefly mentioned Disney, you know, and competition of, of their products potentially coming in. Um, Disney's going to report here after the bell. The stock has actually really run up into the report. I mean, the last month it's gained almost 10% here. What are your thoughts on Disney uh, just, you know, going forward here? And obviously if you know if they can start competing and get a revenue stream, you know, that's competitive with Netflix. What are your thoughts here? Well, I think Disney didn't really run up ahead of the earnings. They've run up the fact that they won the Fox assets, and I think the Fox assets will be the catalyst that Disney needs because, uh, first, Disney is the king of com- of content, and content is king, and this will add to their content because I don't care if you're cutting the cord, skinning the bundle, going over the box, or undersell, whatever you're doing, you have to have content because if there's no content, people, no matter where they are, they'll be staring at a blank screen. So content is important, and Disney is doing an incredible job at the box office. They're going to report a record gain in box office uh, revenue. Also, theme parks are doing very well. And Disney dominates the action adventure genre, which is the most profitable and highest, highest grossing and most profitable movie sector, and also has a huge halo effect to park rides, park experience, uh, licensing fees, but, toys, all other uh, sources of revenue. Ivan, Ivan, uh, content is getting more and more expensive, though, and it's only going to keep getting more and more expensive. And it, uh, at, at some point, doesn't doesn't the bottom have to drop out? No, I mean, good con- good content is valuable. Um, now, action adventure is the most expensive content, but there's a lot of content. You know, dramas and comedies don't really cost a lot to uh, put on or, or to produce and we are seeing a lot of dramas and comedies with uh, lesser known actors that are also uh, gaining notoriety and are very talented so there is a source of really good content that doesn't cost a lot uh, but uh, one of the key things about uh, franchise value content is it has a uh, a consistent track record of success. I mean, the reason that Disney originally bought Lucasfilms is because of the consistent success of Star Wars. And two things that George Lucas said he wasn't going to make any more Star Wars movies. And Disney, I think, would have, there was no other firm or a studio that could have maximized the value of Star Wars the way Disney could and has. Ivan, I got to ask you here about uh, Newell Brands, uh, the old Rubbermaid RBD got shellacked yesterday on Monster Volume from 2657 to 2276 here, uh, and not showing much of a rebound here um, in the after hours or pre markets. Uh, any thoughts on NWL? I, I think it's an interesting uh, situation. I think the, the downside is minimal. There's a lot of value in the stock. Uh, their plan is to spin off up, um, some leading brands or cut some of the deadwood and give them money to continue to buy back stock. It has a 4% yield. You have both Starboard Value and Carl Icahn involved. These are two very successful activists who really work well with companies. I, I, I mean, if you look at both their histories, they work with companies to build value. They really don't work with companies just to uh, strip them and sell them. So uh, all of the brands that um, Newell has, especially Rubbermaid, is doing well. Uh, 
unfortunately, in the current structure of the company, the company is not doing well. So uh, I think it's fixable. I think that the activists involved are catalysts for positive change. I think the company will generate more cash and buy back stock. So there's value there. So I think I, I, I was, I thought the stock was interesting in the mid 20s. There's definitely good value here in the low. At 22, I think there's very little downside. You get 4% dividend to wait it out to see what happens. And I think there's upside to the high 20s. Uh, I have one more and we'll let you go. Uh, still bullish on Herbalife? Yes, I am. They just had their best quarter in the history of the company. That first of all, the whole Herbalife and the multi-level marketing industry actually was helped by Bill Ackman. The rules and uh, uh, requirements put in place make the leading companies like Herbalife, New Skin, and USANA stronger. And uh, it shows. It just shows that uh, first of all, uh, people want to pursue good nutrition. You need to take supplements, and that is driving strong demand for Herbalife's products. They continue to introduce new products, and uh, that is also a big driver. They are signing on new distributors. They are signing on new customers. They uh, emerged from a very difficult situation, a better company. And uh, 2017 was a transition year as they fought off Ackman and went through all the issues. And now 2018 is a growth year. And their the first quarter was good. Their second quarter, as I said, record results. So I think uh, there's growth ahead of the company and there's value there. And the stock will probably continue to trade higher. Or I believe will continue to trade higher. All right. Ivan Fine said thanks for the time this morning. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Let's get back to the earnings parade. Uh, I wanted to go to Twilio because that is the gainer of the morning. Holy cow, did this thing take yeah. off like a rocket yesterday after the bell. Uh, let me pull up the earnings here. Q2 EPS, uh, three cent uh, gain versus a five cent loss estimate. Sales 147.7 versus $131 million. So nice beats for the Q2 numbers. The Q3 guidance coming in higher, uh, two to three cents versus a zero cent estimate. Uh, sales guidance also higher by $15 million, 150 to 135 million. Fiscal year guidance, EPS and sales also higher, everything higher for Twilio. This uh, stock did nothing for the better part of a year and a half. It had the IPO back in 2016, ran quickly from 25 up to 70. And then by the end of 2016, had given it all back. It hung out between basically 25 and 35 for two years. So from the end of 2016 all the way up to the middle of 2018, before it finally started breaking out, I guess in the spring of 2018. And uh, that's just this year, obviously. And it has just been off the races. So it's been a great year here for Twilio. The great year continues here, as obviously, you know, the wind is in its sails here now. Um, that being said, you know, this is a big pop for it now. Um, I think if you're coming in here now, you're late to the party because the stock's already doubled this year. 7550 is your pre-market high. That eclipses the former all-time high by quite a bit. That was a 7096. So uh, I guess you could call that support if we do go into retreat. A uh, lot of consolidation here. Uh, some pretty good trading going on here, right? The 7350, 74 even levels. So um, I'm looking, you hold 70, let's call it 73. Give it a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, you had a low a couple brackets ago. It, I don't know, it's really the mid 73s. I have to say it's 73 and a half of support, folks. If it takes that, could see some downside. Jump over to Etsy last night, too, because it's getting a big lift. And this is one I'm kicking myself on. I had this on my buy list, and I wanted to buy it down in the 30s, and I just never pulled the trigger. I mean, it's been a rocket ship, too. 2017, this was a $9 stock. It's now $47 here in the pre-market. It's been a great 2018 for it. Stocks went from 20 to 40. When it broke out was really when I wanted to buy it. And then I was looking while well, the earnings were coming up. I didn't want to hold it through the earnings report. So I laid off. Obviously, it would have been a good, you know, holder. Or, or no, what was that? June. That wasn't the earnings. What was the move in June, Bratzi? What was the move in June? What was the big move? It went from like 30. To, there was a reason I didn't buy it. I oh, the e commerce tax, the, the, the Supreme Court ruling. Is right. that what it was? 
anyways, whatever it was, the thing blasts off in orbit. So I was kicking myself after the big gap up there and still kicking myself here now as the stock continues to find buyers. It's loved by the market. Um, I don't know long term, you know, valuation is scary as hell on something like this. But short term, it's still loved. Eventually, you know, these things, you know, can fizzle out. But right now, I'll tell you, it's hot. All right. The numbers from yesterday for Etsy, uh, Q2 just EPS, seven cents versus a four cent estimate sales, 132.3 versus $127 million. So beats on the Q2 numbers, raising their guidance for the fiscal year. Sales guidance got raised from 582 million to 587 million on the low end of the range. Uh, gross merchandise sales guidance also got ranged. Um, uh, a, a decent tick. So raise guidance and beats on the earnings for Etsy. Let's go do a little education here for a couple of seconds. There's 177 stocks report today. So if you know if there's some one stock you want to talk about, you know, we'll jump into it. Uh, we're going to bring Nick in on the fly, but I just want to start a little education. We get Nick's thoughts on this here too. I trade the earnings stock sometimes. Ecograph is asking, you know, is there any strategies to watch, you know, when the earnings come out and ride these for 15 minutes after hours after they beat? Or, you know, is there, you know, or having an order ready for the big beats and the moment it pauses, you get out. I mean, there's a lot. It depends on how liquid the stock is. So on the really liquid ones, you can get out pretty easily. On the thinner ones, there's just no out. So if you're trading something thinner, you got to be right. And if you're wrong, sometimes there's just no bids, sometimes for 10% down. So I would say if you are trading and you're new to trading and you want to trade after hours moves, trade them with light size at first till you get your feet wet and then start to get a feel. But the turns can be pretty quick too, and the turns can be violent. So you've got to be very careful, especially the first minute or two after the report. I'd say the first minute or two, you get a lot of gyrations, you get a lot of you know chop. It can get a little bit you know dicey there. Uh, so I usually try to lay off for the first minute or two until I get a feel for whether you know they're really liking it or not. And then once I got the feel, then I might jump in. Also, you know, there's the sympathy plays and the bigger ones you can sometimes play as well, but it's kind of an art and it takes a long time to get really good at trading earnings reports. The, 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 the volatility is incredible and you can make a lot of money if you get good at it, but you can lose a lot of money in a hurry if you're not good at it. So you got to be very cautious too when you're trading some of these things, because if you miss the turn and it's ball starts going in the other direction, you can get hurt really bad, really quickly. Indeed. Nick Shaheen is in the background here, and we were just talking about trading earnings reports. And do you trade the earnings ever, or do you kind of wait till the dust settles and trade them the next day? I, I do. Uh, I do lottos. Uh, yesterday, I missed out on a big one. I meant to short uh, Zillow, oh, and, and, but I, but I didn't. But usually, why didn't you? You forgot about it, or you just got sidetracked? Yes, no, I was busy, uh, still catching up, and um, so. Yeah, I don't like to put a lot of money onto the earnings because short term, I, I can't tell you which way they're going to go, even if we knew exactly the results. So it's more of a guessing game. Uh, I'd rather wait for the after uh, event and see if I can profit from it. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult. Sometimes you'll see a company come out and beat on the top, beat on the bottom. Like look at U.S. Steel from last week. They beat on the top, they beat on the bottom, and they raised guidance. Stock pops from 35 up to 38 after hours. And then they just started coming with selling pressure, selling pressure. I can remember talking to my buddy at break because, you know, we, we, we talk all, all the time and it was coming in. I'm like, you know what? It was like 36 and a half. I'm like, this thing's going to go red. I'm like, this is literally giving back so much. When they get back two thirds of the gains, they usually get back all of it. You know, that's kind of my rule of thumb. If you see a stock that's got pretty good numbers and it pops, but then starts giving it back and then gives back two thirds, usually it goes red. So, you know, often I will actually short a stock on good numbers just because of that. You know, sometimes it depends on volume too. Obviously, it doesn't always work the case, but U.S. Steel opened down the next day on that report and then lost another three bucks. So here you are, you know, probably scratching your head saying, how in the hell is this thing now at $31 when they beat on the top, beat on the bottom and raise guidance? It's not always, you know, it doesn't work that way always. It's about sentiment coming in and how everybody's positioned. And just because they beat on the top and the bottom doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go higher. And I can tell you, speaking to you as steel, just from the chart, uh, it's not a guarantee it's not going to go any lower and lose 30 because uh, technically they've had a couple of bounces around this area. Yeah. Um, I think the one that's slightly deeper is uh, back to February 5th or something. Um, yeah, February 5th. 
was like 3087 or something like that. So be careful. If those are lost, uh, there, there might be a little dip down to the lower end of the value area, which is probably 30 and change. So um, maybe not, not done there. But back to the point, which is earnings. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. We can't tell what they're going to do because they may, like in Zillow's uh, case, I think, um, you know, they missed, I think, on one, one of the two. But the guidance was weak. And then they add another wrinkle which is oh by the way we bought a mortgage company for an undisclosed amount and that comes right after when they also uh, decided that they're going to buy homes as well for investment purposes so suddenly the simple statement uh, the simple business model that they had going which was information provider all kinds of advertising and now it becomes less clear so with less clarity comes uncertainty pricing we're on the line with Nick Shaheen. He's the author of Create Income with Option Spreads. He joins us just about every Tuesday. Nick, you sound a little bit better today. I'm glad to, glad to hear you're recovering from your trap. Uh, we got a question here about Baidu, B-I-D-U. Some of these Chinese stocks have been under pressure. Uh, this one, 229.30 is where it is trading down today. They have a low of the move at 226.21. You doing any uh, sniper put selling or put spreads on this one? BIDU, Dick. Um, y- yes, I, I do uh, like Baidu. Uh, it's stuck in the um, the China headline whipsaw trade, so it's one of those companies that I would be willing to take some risk on um, into it. Uh, so it, it has clear uh, lines of support. If I look at the weekly chart, I can I can see where I'm willing to own it. And I can sell puts or put spreads down in those area. So it all depends on personal uh, preference as far as uh, the level of risk I'm willing to take and where I place it. I'm conservative, so I don't like to sell puts like just under where we're at because I don't want to take over the stock right away. But uh, I am willing to go out in time and well below, like um, in this case, in, 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 I can get to the $200 level and below and still carry some premium through 2018 and get paid handsomely for it. And you know, stocks like this, I'm not too worried about it unless the whole market picture changes. So in this current market environment, yeah, I'm a fan of it and I could risk some money into it. Let's talk about the run in Apple here, Nick. Yeah, I know you yeah. were bullish into the report and after the report, you were like, I'm still bullish. I'm not fighting the tape on it. Uh, I, has it exceeded your targets here? Yeah. What uh, are you looking more meat on the bone here in the Apple rally? Well, if you have longs, uh, yeah, I trimmed mine. Uh, obviously, I didn't trim them at the top because it still ran after that. But I can't complain about the profits I got from it. But I stayed long proxy Apple with Qs and SPY, as I've been telling people. So, you know, my targets in the S&P include Apple, obviously. And um, it, they've been paying and they're still paying me. So, yes, I did trim my actual Apple profits, but I'm still long Apple via the market. And without, I mean, it's still 20 PE probably tra- trailing. So I know historically Apple doesn't carry a premium there. It always uh, is a, quote, good value because of it. But um, maybe this is changing. Plus, 13 Fs are coming out soon in the next couple of weeks, I think. I don't know. Uh, it's, it feels like it. The 14th. So, the 14th, okay. So in a week, what are we going to read? People selling Apple or buying Apple? Did Buffett add or sell? He doesn't sell um, often. So most likely he's going to be um, adding or the company itself or other people, other whales that people like to track. And those headlines will probably spur another burst. But for now, if somebody wants to trim their profits, it's a pretty good idea. Nick, what about these moves in the biotech stocks, especially? Ooh. Well, let's just not even go biotech. Let's go big pharma because uh, big pharma yeah. has really blasted off here. I mean, Merck, Pfizer, Lilly, all in rocket ship mode here. Like, look at Lilly since they announced, you know, especially since they announced they're going to do that spinoff on their animal care uh, division there. The stock is up 12 points. Merck as well is straight up. And then Pfizer, this is the biggest move in Pfizer in a long time. We are finally getting back for all those buy and hold investors mm-hmm. from the year 2000, 18 years ago. We are finally back into the 40s here. I think the all-time high was like 45 or 46 bucks or something. I'm just going from my memory on Pfizer. We're finally starting to get back up there. 
thoughts here on big pharma i do full disclosure on pfizer and Merck in my investment portfolio okay so pfizer i did share a a monthly chart that played out um oops i mistyped it sorry that's pfizer not pde so it's a monthly chart breakout in pfizer and you can see it only if you switch to a monthly candle um, and you can see that it could have a lot of legs higher it has been collecting higher lows on a monthly basis uh, bumping along a, um, a roof line of 37 and, and change. So after they break through it, uh, they should have energy to go much higher than that. That's Pfizer specifically. Um, IBB, I did a video yesterday, which I shared this morning with uh, members. And it's I did short it recently. And I'll share an IBB chart in a second. And it played out exactly how I wanted to, but not all the way through. So it may have another leg lower. It's not a forecast, it's just a trading opportunity. So a debit put spread might be the way to play it. Um, and it's basically the red box that played for me on the chart I just posted. And now it could be falling back down, mainly because of one guy in there. You know, the IBV is heavy with the top five uh, stocks that are in it. And one of them is Biogen, not to pick on the company, itself, but the price action of late is very sloppy. So it leaves room for wishes up or down. And it just looks like it could be more down than up. So conviction is at least no better than medium on this one, but a debit put spread in either BIIB or IBB might be a way to play this. So I'm not picking on the company's business, it's just price action. Spencer, right. I think that was your All right. Go, I guess but... I guess I'll go. I, yeah, I was well, it says you want to ask it. <laughs> we're in the look, we're in the background on the Slack. You're not reading your Slack. <laughs> I, I didn't mean it is like you're slacking. Okay, okay. okay. I, I, oh my gosh. This is about looking at the background. And Spencer says, Oh, I guess Spencer says sure. I was I was even confused. So Joel, this is your fault. <laughs> okay, no no one's fault. It's fine. It's no. Joel's fault. Nick, it's always you, Joel's fault. Nick, Nick. Just got, what, no, this is not what, my fault. Nick, what's important <laughs> what's what's important is that it's not my fault. No. <laughs> it's not, it's definitely not Nick's fault. No, we're Nick, blaming Joel or Spencer. I'm going with Joel this time. I actually just mis misinterpreted it. All right. Because he said sure to, to Joel. No, Joel, my, all right, fault. my fault. Nick A AMD. Thoughts on the advanced <laughs> micro devices. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, AMD, I'd rather go Intel. I think it caught a downgrade yesterday. AMD is too high for me up here. Uh, fundamentally, I like to sell risk into value, and I don't think there's tangible value in AMD uh, from the metrics perspective. Uh, so Intel was downgraded yesterday for some, I can't remember the reason. It didn't sound like a good reason to me. So on the dip yesterday, I, was, I would have sold the puts and put spreads for 2018 in, in Intel. So... Uh, I pulled a switcheroo on you there. So to talk to A&D's chart, uh, it's, um, again, it's a monthly breakout that I shared a long time ago. I'm going to share it here. I, I believe I've shared it on your show months and months ago. And the breakout played out. And from here, it's just, um, I, you know, I don't know where it's going to go from here. I, I have less faith in that technical aspect of it. And since I don't have the value aspect, it's in the penalty box for me personally. Other people might know more about it and can probably see even uh, much higher prices down the line. The next eyeball target would be like 23 plus based on the monthly chart. Talk about yeah. Intel just in the in context of AMD because AMD's gain has been Intel's loss as of late. Intel disappointing on the report. Trying to come back here. I own Intel in my investment portfolio. I wish I didn't because it's been the underperformer here. I actually traded AMD in for Intel, which I guess I shouldn't have did. But thoughts here on Intel. Okay, so Intel. This is a weekly chart because we can. Uh, we we. It's easier to see. It just takes away a lot of the messy daily moves. And you can see the, the zones, the boxes I draw. Usually I put the boxes, they're not scientific. They're, I'm not a technical analyst. This is my visual representation of where the pivot points are. Where likely there's gonna be fights between bulls and bears. So there'll be support on the way down and resistance on the way up. That tells me where to get in and get out um, or where not to get in and get out. So it's right in between two zones, which brings the opportunity to sell risk below the lower zone. And if um, I can get out once it hits the upper zones to, to not leave the profits on. So if I'm going out in time, 42, 44 looks like they strong support, but there's definitely support higher than that, which was recent, which is just above 46. 
So it all depends on your timing and where you're selling risk. Uh, Nick, uh, I want to ask you just about uh, Bank America here, uh, the financials. I mean, it's a slow moving stock. I mean, it looks like it's clearing out this 3150 here. Uh, can you give me any help to clarify this uh, another breakout? Maybe I'm going back to the highs of the move. Okay, so I've been long banks for a while. And the way I've done it, you know, the best way to explain how I did it. Remember that one day, not too long ago, they fell 4%. Uh, and I'm, I can't, what, can't remember what stupid move that was uh, by markets. I sold as many puts as I could and as many banks as I could. And Bank of America was one of them. And it played out very easy win for me because I didn't even have to revisit that day. So Bank of America here is not an obvious entry point for me. Uh, especially that people expect the interest rate to be running uh, wild, and it's not going to be until Draghi says they're going to be doing what the U.S. is doing, which is dialing back their QE from the sense starting to dial up their rates, so to speak, because until then, people who want to invest in, invest in bonds outside the U.S. have to come in to buy the R bonds, and if they buy R bonds, then the rates here, the yields cannot go up. Uh, so if the bank trade is tied to rates, it's not an obvious entry point. I don't exit, I don't short it. Um, I just, it's hard for me to start adding more Bank of America here. And if I do, I would do it via a debit call spread um, and I would use September, October, or even longer um, expiration dates. All right, Nick, thanks for coming out with us. Nick Shahina, author of Create Income with Options Spread. Thanks for the time. Sure thing. Looking forward to the next one. All right, let's. Can we go over to Cigna? Because I want to. I want to cover this news before we we wrap up today. Uh, uh, Carl Icahn's open letter is out this morning. He is opposing their merger with Express Scripts. Um, he re, instead of buying uh, Express Scripts outright, he would rather Cigna uh, partner with them or a company like them. And uh, surprise, surprise, he'd prefer if they bought back stock instead of using the capital for an, an acquisition. Uh, guys, thoughts on uh, Cigna this morning? I mean, it's a. I, I, I tend to agree with I, uh, Carl here, and he's going to put this letter out here, and we'll be able to read it later today. I don't think it's published no, it's yet. It's out. Oh, it is out. It yeah, came out. Yeah, it was out at like six a.m. Okay, it came out this morning. Anyways, um, I, I tend to agree with him. It's a huge purchase for sale, and I always like you know it give me a dividend or you know buybacks uh, other than you know just wait and putting your money into an acquisition as a Cigna shareholders. I would not be surprised if CI actually trades up on this here today. Um, just because I think it was a big pill for them to swallow. Do I think the deal's still going through? Yeah, I think the deal's still going through. Um, I don't think Carl's going to stop it, but ESRX here is trading down a buck fifty on the news here. Go ahead a few days ago, maybe it was deal worries there too, but I think there's buyers below. I think if you got down near, I don't think it's going to whoosh down to 72 or anything. I think if it got down there, I think there's all kinds of buyers in 72 and 73. I think the risk arbs still feel that the deal is probably going through, or at least, you know, it's not going to be Carl that stops it. And I wouldn't be surprised if they buy, you know, on the dip here. Uh, three day low, 7511. You haven't even reached that yet. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. Well, actually, your pre market low is 7510. So not a lot of action going on. Of course, if in fact you do breach 75, you have that one big day, that big whoosh. But I expect uh, to see some buyers, like Dennis said, uh, well ahead of that low, that pre market low. Uh, excuse me, that the recent low of the move was 72 even. That was on August 1st. Let's go to Crocs here on the earnings report. And I just want to talk about, you know, trading because we were just talking about trading earnings reports. And I was long Crocs coming into this report and they beat and it looked pretty good. Um, so, you know, I was kind of happy when I came in this morning and I saw the stock trading higher. I was like, oh, this is a pretty good report. You got to read the tea leaves and you got to be able to read, you know, what's happening in the pre-market. Um, so it, it, it trades up. Um, there was an offer, 1869, takes that out. Goes all the way up to 1950, but very little volume up there. I would have been selling all day up in the 19s. There was no way really to get out. There, I think I traded like a total of like 300 or 400 shares up there. Really didn't trade much at all up at 1950. But then it comes reoffered at 1850 with an iceberg order. And the 1850 will not move. It's literally like tr people are trying to lift it. They think, oh, this is a pretty good report. 1850 guy will not move. One player on a small stock like this will affect everything. So this player, I'm like, this is a big fish. This big fish is not moving. I need to sell. So I actually did lighten up a little bit at 1850. I lightened up some more at 1840. And then the iceberg stepped down to 1810 and would not move. And I'm like, okay, I'm out. 
I'm getting out here, even though this kind of the stock is beat, even though, you know, I think, you know, fundamentally, you think it should be higher on that. It doesn't matter because that's not what the, the pre-market trading is telling me. So I'm basically out at 1850, 1840, and I sold the rest at 18, 1805 or 1810, right in there too, just because of that seller. Now it's offered at 18, which is down and best bit is down at 17 and a quarter. So by me, you know, not being bullheaded and saying, oh, it beat, it's got to be higher. Me just reading that iceberg order and saying this big fish wants out. One big fish can change everything. It's saved me some money so far. And I would not be surprised if I actually trades in the red if that big fish continues to sell. Now we'll see what happens in the regular session. You know, a lot of funny things can happen. Maybe it turns around and starts to go higher. But as of right now, that big fish still is trying to sell. And I think he's sitting with an 18 iceberg there again. So he keeps lowering and keeps trying to get out of more stock. So stock can beat on the top, beat on the bottom. Doesn't necessarily have to go higher, as we were saying this morning. Spencer, what was the Crocs report? The Q2 EPS, 35 cents, 31 cent estimate sales, 328 versus 321 million dollars. Q3 sales guidance in line, fiscal year sales guidance uh, mostly in line, I'll say. It, it, was, it was okay numbers. The numbers were fine. 1950, like I said, you can just strike that. You see that in the pre-market. There's no way you're going to get out up there unless you were the lucky two or 300 shares that sold up there. You weren't getting out of anything sizable up there at 19 and a half. The best you could have really done here was around the 1850 area. And I, I got out of some of that. So right now it looks weak here. I'm totally out of the position now. I'm glad I'm out and I'm glad I didn't stick with it, hoping it would come back because this big seller in the, mar in the pre-market has been telling me that it doesn't want to. Now, like I said, you know, everything can happen. There's going to be more volume that comes in. Maybe it starts to find a lift. You know, some funny things happen. But as of right now, there's one big fish that wants out and that can push the price down. Uh, that 1950 print, uh, actually, yeah, 1950. How many shares trade up there? Uh, well, on that bracket, uh, a couple thousand traded. But, no, I got uh, it right here. So yeah. I, I'm looking at 200 shares in 1910, 50 shares in 1939, wow. and 50 shares in 1950 for a grand total of 350 shares. So you weren't getting out of anything sizable up there. And that's, you know, good luck, you know, trying to get out on that with a dollar spread. And, you know, you'd be the lucky guy to sold. Somebody's lucky to sell 350 up there, but that's not you know, an $18 here? stock. You're talking about six grand. I mean, you know, there's nothing, you know, nobody's getting out of size up there. You could have got out of some size 1850, 1805, 1810 this morning. That's about it. Uh, go at 17 and a quarter, Dennis. And, what and, did and, you do? Well, no, you got to read. So this is about reading the tape and understanding. We're doing a little lesson tape reading. So that trade on FINRA, that means some retail trader, and it was 100 shares. Some retail trader just said, give me the hell out. And they just hit it down at 17 and a quarter. That's, you know, the 17 and a quarter bid. So some, you know, off exchange market maker just bought it from them at 17 and a quarter. It's already 1750 bid. It's already 18. It's just trading within the spread. It's 1750 to 18 right now. It's so wide, you know, and this is why if you've, if you've got this long or short, it's t difficult to trade this stuff pre-market. Um, you know, it's a lot to read in. If you don't understand what an iceberg order is, it's going to be against you too. An iceberg is an order that just doesn't move. That 18 um, has come down from 1850 to 1840 to 1825 to 1810 to 18, I think they're at now, and they want out and they keep, you know, just not moving. So as people buy that 100 shares, it doesn't move. It means there's more size behind it. We don't know how big that seller is. Maybe he's almost done. And when he's done, maybe it can go higher. Maybe it's a she. We don't know. We, you know, we can't be in there, you know, head. We can't be, we don't know what that order is. We can only take what we're seeing. But with that 100 share offer not moving, it's telling me maybe it could be 100,000 shares. Maybe it's 1,000 shares more. Maybe it's you know, only 100 shares more. We don't know. But all I know is it's been lifted a lot of times and it isn't moving. So it's telling me it's bigger. Yeah, and if in fact it can't catch a bid here, uh, 1841 was yesterday's high. Uh, if the weakness continues, uh, your three-day low comes in at 1755. S&Ps are having a very quiet session here. Uh, up six and a half points, 56.50, just hanging up there, 58.50. But folks, not seeing any major resistance until 66.75. Um, Harry's asking, how can you tell if an iceberg order is someone shorting or someone selling along? Impossible. And you can't. Yeah, possible. There's, that, there, there's a non, you know, that's it's anonymous. So you don't know. There's no like marked, you know, not order any order shows up. It just shows up as a, a sell order. It doesn't show up as sell short. So it's impossible to tell that. Right. It could be somebody shorting. It could be an institution that just, you know, is all on Crocs and doesn't like the, whatever they read and they want out. It could be somebody. That could be short the stock even and just be saying, I'm not letting this thing go higher. There's institutions, maybe somebody short a whole pile of stock 
And they don't want the thing to go higher, obviously, because they're going to lose money. So they're going to try to push this thing down. And they can do that legally by just selling more stock. So, you know, if you're if you were short like 100,000 shares of Crocs and you see this thing go up to 1950, you're like, no, I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to go 1850. It's cost them. Maybe they've sold another 5,000 shares, but they were sold 100,000, so another 105, but they've made the whole thing look weak. That's what it is in the pre-market on smaller stocks. It's all just big fish pushing the stocks to where they want them to go. So a lot of times, believe it or not, a stock is not trading, you know, just because it's fundamental. It could be just trading because one person wants the price lower. And they don't want it to go higher. And if you get the thing looking weak, now everybody's talking, oh, then the, and the media will find a reason for why it's trading down and they'll chase it. And, and, and they'll say, you know, oh, well, they found, you know, this in the report that they didn't like. Meanwhile, it was just one big fish that wasn't going to allow it to go higher. So that happens, you know, and that's, you know, something to consider when you're trading stocks. One big fish makes a big difference on the smaller stocks, especially in the pre-market. Uh, real quickly, uh, we are, um, a quick question, thoughts on Tesla. Would it be wise to short this under 340? I don't know if it's ever wise to short Tesla. We don't um, give investment advice is the first thing to say <laughs> to that because we yep. can never give investment yep. advice on the show. We're not licensed uh, investment advisors to so talk to your investment advice. So we're not going to say if it's wise or not. We can tell what we think. Yes. I've never, I've had real rough money making money on Tesla. And if I, if you're looking at me here, I think Tesla goes higher yet. I think Tesla is squeezed the hell out of everybody here now. There's a whole pile of shorts that are like, oh, it's got to come back in, you know, because it's still not making money. Uh, I think this thing's going to make new all-time highs. So that's my opinion. Um, you know, you, what you know, you do on that is, you know, but I think, I, I think by the end of the year, we're at a new all-time highs on Tesla. Fundamentally, it makes zero sense to me. So, you know, I'll say it again. I've said this before. Um, you know, fundamentally, I don't understand it, but the stock just gets a pass on everything. Maybe they're going to make, you know, that one analyst was coming out and saying they can make $20 a share or $19 a share Ooh. by the year 2020. Who was Guggenheim or something? So one, one of them came out and Who said that they thought they could make $19 a share by, I saw it on CNBC, the guy was on CNBC. I'm going for my memory, so don't quote me on this because I don't, might be wrong on it, but I'm pretty sure he said they thought he thought they could make $19 a share by 2020. If this company starts making that kind of cash, you are going to see the world, the shorts in a world of her because this, if this made $20 a share, this isn't going to be at 400 This is going to be at 600 So I, I'd be very scared if I was short Tesla. Uh, I just got uh, an interesting note here on Tesla matching ranges yesterday, uh, 355 and 354.98. So right there, uh, there's your your resistance with a double top at 355. And on the downside, uh, a pair of matching lows, 342. Uh, 53 and 341.82. So that's pretty rare. So I don't know, maybe if it breaks out of the, the range either way, but right now it's consolidating and volume is coming down a little bit, folks. Uh, 23 million on that big update, 13 and a half million yesterday, eight and a half million, uh, or uh, 13 and a half million on Friday, eight and a half million yesterday. So, you know, got to find some new buyers at this levels, but until we take out 342. Uh, trading range 342 to 355 all right spencer i'm gonna let you wrap up the show and uh you guys uh you're gonna be on your own for the rest of the week i'm actually going to a montana uh, wedding in montana at glacier national park so if i don't get eaten by any bears <laughs> i will be back on monday and uh but uh seems like you guys got it spencer wrap things up and not preview what is the there? show for Wednesday. What is there in Montana besides bears? Is there anything? And, and glaciers apparently. I guess the glaciers are melting, so I better get out there pretty <laughs> better quickly. better hurry up. All right. Uh, that's going to be it for us today, guys. Uh, if you want to catch our podcast, you can do so. Uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play, or just watch the show on YouTube. Thanks to our guests, Nick Shaheen and Ivan Feinseth. One last reminder that all of the information presented on today's show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice. Hope everyone has had a good morning. Hope you have a good rest of your day and hope you join us again on Wednesday. <laughs>